Welcome to Turn the Lights Out podcast with myself, Dave Owen, and James Lilly. This is episode three of the video recording, and if you're listening just on the audio, this is episode 12. Uh, I'm especially excited tonight because we have the best guest we've had, basically. Um, the current UFC bantamweight, Mr. Brett Johns. Welcome, Brett. How are you, boys? Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Like I said, quite exciting because we both big UFC fans, big, big mixed martial arts fans. And to have you on is uh, a bit of a coup for us. So appreciate it. And um, just a chance for you to tell your story to anyone who haven't heard it before. And uh, let Swansea and the surrounding areas know that they've got a bit of a bit of a star on their hands. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I think a lot of people, like, I'm, I'm quite well known in Swansea, but I think that audience can definitely get bigger, like, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I appreciate, appreciate you having me on. Thank you. No problem at all. Um, let's start right at the very beginning then. For people who don't know, you come from a, a judo background and um, I've seen on previous interviews and, and um, articles on you that you were hoping to go to the 2012 Olympics, is that right? Yeah, definitely. I, was, I think that's, that's every judo player's dream, really, you know. Um, my, my, my mother was a single parent growing up in Pond de Lice, you know. Um, my father left, my real father left when I was about four years old, I think. Um, I'm, I'm, she was taking my older sister to judo. I was, she wasn't too far away from my, my house at the time. Uh, then she took me and my younger brother, like we were called the crazy Pond de Lice, me and my, my brother. Like, we're not, we're, you're not between us, we're not even twins, but... Um, but I went to the, we went to the local judo club. Uh, my mother met my stepfather then, Andrew Burt, who was who was my who's been my judo coach since. And yeah, for for years the, the goal was the 2012, you know. And um, obviously leading up to about I think I got eight, I hit about 15, 16, and then realised look that's an unrealistic goal, you know. I'm trying to be the best in Britain. I wasn't even the best in my gym, you know. I had a guy called Kyle Davis who was like one of my my best mates, you know, and a very high level judo player. So um, yeah, like I said, that was unrealistic. And then I wanted a crossover. My, what, I could have crossed over my sport that I was, I, well, I thought I was good at, to something that I could use it, you know, yeah, more. Yeah, adapt it. So, adapt yeah, it's just it, like, yeah. it's, it's not like a football player coming to 16 and deciding he wants to do boxing, it don't make sense, you know, but at least with, with me, it was like, right, okay, I want to do, do judo, and I think, oh, I could cross over to MMA quite well, and um, that's where it all began. Have you always watched MMA and always had an interest in it, or? The first event I watched was uh, 84, UFC Will. the main event, and that was... Um, BJ Penn versus Sean Shirk. Nice. Sean Shirk's one of my favourite fighters. Short, stocky, five foot six yeah. wrestler in the lightweight yeah. division. Like a bowling ball, the guy was. And uh, he was he was class, you know what I mean? I loved watching him. And I remember watching highlight videos before that fight, thinking, this guy is the Don, like, you know, he's the lightweight, he was the former lightweight champ. And then uh, he went in the fight and got flying knee by BJ Penn. <laughs> so that kind of stopped me from watching. I stopped watching him a little bit after that. Um, like you said, he was a judo. Um, and then you decided to go to a Try to try your hand at MMA. Um, you with Chris Reese, Chris Reese Academy. Have you always been with Chris, and how did that relationship come about? Yeah, well, I've always been, I've always been with Chris. Um, obviously, I started off with Chris originally to better my ground game for judo. You know, because uh, obviously in judo you only get a couple of seconds on the floor, but if you're working with a choke, they'll, they'll let it go on. And most of my judo fights were kind of I was losing by like subs and getting held down. So. I went with Chris and obviously worked on that aspect. And obviously, I, at the time, I went and watched um, watched the guys who were me and Dino Gandessa, you know, a guy who was at my weight in Swansea. He's like the the first guy who really did quite well in, in British yeah, martial yeah, arts. Yeah. You know, he fought the best guys out there. He fought guys like James Doolan, Greg Knapp, he fought all them guys. And uh, I watched Dino train there and I fell in love, you know. I mean, I watched him train with loads of different guys. I mean, my first... Uh, one of my first ever MMA sessions, like Jordan James basically broke my nose, you know what I mean? My first That's ever MMA session. That, that was a hard spot, you know what I mean? <laughs> There's me playing jujitsu off my back, thinking, oh, this is brilliant, and then a punch straight to the centre, whap, I soon realised that you couldn't do a lot of BJJ then. Yeah, you know that's, I mean? uh, that's Jordan all over. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 guy, the, the guy's a bull, you know what I mean? He hasn't changed. <laughs> oh, he hasn't changed all the years. Like he hasn't, you know what I mean? He's from up your way as well, isn't he, Jordan? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's not too far away from us. And uh, obviously, Kyle, we were on about earlier, it's, it's his cousin. It's Kyle, it's oh, is all, it? Yeah. So that's what I know. And I, I usually go to watch uh, the rallying with Jordan. You know, I go to Wales Rally GB with him and Kyle. And uh, like, we've always kind of known each other quite well. So um, obviously, with him on the, the Budo card now, when he gets his rematch with Ali, you know, it's going to be a. Uh, I'll be down in Swansea watching that one, definitely, you know? Yeah, it's going to be a tasty one. Um, go back to with your relationship with Chris. 
from what I've seen in, in shows and obviously on social media, and, and you do a lot of cornering with the guys from your gym as well, you two seem to be have a really, really close relationship. Uh, seem to have grown more and more over the years. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's, impo it's important to have that sort of bond. You know, I think uh, McGregor's got with Kavanagh. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different sort of top level fighters who've got their good relationships with their with their coaches. You know, um, I feel like obviously when I'm not, everybody's different. You know, some people do well without a proper coach then, with loads of coaches around them, and then other guys like me who I've got my one set coach who I talk to. Like Chris does everything for me, you know what I mean? He gets my sparring sorted out, he gets my um, my strength and conditioning sorted out, he gets all these different things sorted out for me. And even the weight cut, he's he's there for the full week doing my weight cut with me, you know? So um, obviously with, with Chris being there, it's, it's a big help for me and it's, um, it's, it makes my life a lot easier, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, years ago when I was... Uh, when I was competing, you know, I do a lot more work than what I do now, you know. So hitting that, hitting that level, now he's he's taking a lot of responsibilities on, and uh, for me, it's like a case of I like, will get an email from my phone from the UFC, and I'm like, Chris, I, uh, you know, I, my my wires got all crossed, and like you have got to sort that out, buddy. <laughs> and he's like, right, send it to me, and he sorts it out. So, so yeah, my relationship with him has been brilliant over the years. It's been absolutely amazing, and uh, like I said, you know, we, we were um, me and I, I say me and Chris, you know what I mean? I don't I don't believe that. I would, I would be where I am with Chris, you know? So it's like, well, me and Chris won our first world title with Cage Warriors. Then we managed to get, we were like the first Welsh guys to fight out in the States and fight for a, sorry, we were the first Welsh guys to fight out in the States and fight for a world title. You know, we were the first, first Welsh guys to fight in the States, but we were the first to go out there and fight for a title. Yeah. Um, so that was another thing ticked off my list. I, for me, I think a lot of fighters, their dreams is to go, oh, like, I'm gonna fight in the UFC, that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, for me, it wasn't like that. First thing I wanted to do was win a belt. I just wanted to win a belt. I thought that the, I thought having a belt was class. You know, I think there's nothing, there's no better feeling than, than having a belt. Um, I, I won that first belt in Penland Social Club in Swansea. I had an absolute tune in for three rounds, but won the belt. <laughs> and then obviously you get, you, I give myself little goals. So after that, I was going professional and doing well there. Got the five and zero. I thought right, if I for a title, I fought for a title there. And then it was going up and up and up. And eventually, then we had the world title shot with Cage Warriors. Kind of bitten off a bit more of my chew on that night, you know. I had a bit of a bit of a pace in that night as well. It was a total performance. Yeah, 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 four twice in two, same night, two yeah. fights in one night, and uh, I, I remember like at the end of the night, and I was oh, I, I had, like it looked like I had Botox in my lips and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It was uh, absolute nuts, and uh, and afterwards I remember thinking I'll never ever do that again. Like you know, that was that was that was crazy. You know, uh, that was an opportunity that you couldn't. I was going to ask, when did you realize that I could I could make a career out of this, but. Yeah. In that Cage Warriors scenario, it's a yeah. chance you can't turn down. No, that was that was that was when you know I thought like uh, you know I thought McAllister who was um, James McAllister, a really good guy from Dinky Ninjas in Scotland. Uh, comes, there's an amazing team up there, and uh, he came down seven and one. You know, good record. I think I was like five and zero, oh, six and zero oh at the time. And I remember I had this chance and I thought, well, this this kid's good. I was watching his videos and he fought Steve McComb, guy from Northern Ireland, uh, footlock specialist. You know what I mean? He, he's the type of guy running a fight, falling his back and trying to footlock you. And he absolutely obliterated him, split him open. It was a horrific fight to watch. When you know as a fight then you watch, you think, right, what's this guy like his videos? And you turn on it, and he's him absolutely batting another guy, and you're thinking, right, that's not good for my confidence, you know. <laughs> yeah. And McAllister was like that, but you know, in the fight, he, he happened to have um, Paul McVeigh in the corner, who was the first Cage Warriors Batman champion. So and he's and he was the only one at that time. So I went uh, I remember the second round looking over and Paul kind of looked at me and gave me a slot just to say, like, oh look, McAllister. Kind of done you, you know. I mean, he was really gassed out. So second we went and we managed to get the knockout stoppage in the second round, and then that's when they said, "Look, how would you fancy fighting for a title?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's, that's amazing, cool." And they said, "It's two fights in one night." Yeah, amazing. And then they <laughs> give me the list of people who were in it, and I was like, I, I, "I've been putting you to lose. I've been putting you to make the numbers up." Are you like um, an MMA fan then? So you know all the other fighters in your division and stuff because we were like speaking to Lou Long on the first film and he doesn't follow uh, it. He no. doesn't always fight in. He just knows the no. name and the belt. Lou's like that. Lou's like really relaxed <laughs> yeah. about it. I, I, I'm not. I, like, I, I always, even now in the UFC, I'm always looking at the domestic scene such as Cage Warriors, Bama. Them fights I, I watch carefully, you know what I mean? Because they're the guys who are coming for the ranks. I can't keep tracks on every single promotion. There's hundreds out no, there. Like, yeah. But like the ones that I fought or I know of, I'll watch carefully. So yeah, I am a big fan. Like, I, I know a lot of different fighters. I know who they fought. I know their fighting styles. And like even when they, they announced that in the tournament at that time, it was, um, it was uh, Martin McDonald and Mr. Pink. Good, good decent yeah, level, yeah, yeah, decent yeah, level yeah, hands, you know? Only, yeah, yeah, he was yeah, good, yeah, he was good at the time. Uh, there was James Pennington, who was like uh, seven and one, seven and two at the time, and then there was David Hagstrom, the Swedish guy, you know. And um, 
he was he was seeded number one, so he was the best guy there. Then he went to Penton, then he went to Mark McDonald, then he went to me. So I was fourth. And what they do in the tournaments, they put first seed with fourth and second seed with third. So I had to fight the best guy first of all, which was, well, I know people would probably argue with that, but I definitely think so to this day. Hagstrom was like top five in Europe at the I time. I think I, I was speaking to Dino, was that that one? Yeah. And, and he said about Hagstrom, he yeah. said he is, he's legit. Because at that, at that time, like, it was like, I think I fought him and beat him. And then the only two guys who, who beaten him were two boys from Swansea. You know what I mean? Me and Dino, you know, the two guys. Yeah. And he said, but even Dino said, like, you know, the, at the time, I said, what do you think of the fight? And, you know, Dino was like, this is a tough fight. And because uh, Dino fought him and said, like, he, he said, Hagstrom was amazing. He said, and uh, I think Dino caught him with a triangle in the second round or something. Yeah, but and Dino, was, Dino said he was like, it was the hardest fight. Out of all my fights, that was the most difficult fight because he said he was good. And even, I think he says, he says, I got lucky with that, like, you know? <laughs> and Hagstrom, Hagstrom is class. And even to this day now, looking back, he, he did well. But he, 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 after my fight, he didn't fight for a while, and then he fought um, a tough veteran and then lost that fight. So he's 7-3 at the minute, but I don't think he's... Uh, Plan to come back. He's had a kid and stuff now, so concentrate on that. I think. So, like you say, you genuinely think you were put in in the tournament to lose, but you come out with the belt. Two fights, one night. How did did life change at all uh, when you got the world? When your class as world champion? Yeah, so? that was that was the thing. I I always, I, say, I always say these like the, the little goals, and obviously at that world title, I thought right here it comes the big money, the big fights. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what you do think as a world champion. I look at the guys like. I know it's some it's, it's, I look at guys like Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, world champs, and you know, wow, this is this is where it's going to happen. My life didn't change. In fact, I, I, you know, at that time, I was I was I was didn't earn a lot of money at that time. You know what I mean? It was um, for fighters, as a lot of people probably know, sponsorships quite hard to get. You know, and um, yeah, I won that fight, and it was it was hell of a fight. You know, but um, that's so <coughs> we're gonna go into Titan FC, and obviously you getting called up the UFC, so. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back after this. Welcome back to part two, guys. Brett, so won your world title, Cage Warriors. First defence, hometown Swansea. What was that like? <laughs> It was, uh, it was, I was absolutely buzzing, you know what I mean? Um, fighting in Cardiff was, was amazing, but it's my hometown, Swansea is my home. And um, Cage Warriors come down. I, originally, I was going to fight in Newcastle, believe it or not, but um, I, I pulled out and uh, actually David Drown calls down, actually, believe it or not. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he jumped my back in a seminar. And I, I, I twisted my knee badly. <laughs> you know, there's guys like 80 odd kilo yeah. jumping on a guy. Like, dude, and uh, yeah, after I pulled out that fight, and then it was scheduled for Swansea, first one Swansea would seen. And, and it was amazing. Like uh, I sold a lot of tickets for that fight, and prep went absolutely amazing. Um, leading up to the fight, I was in the best shape of my life. It was the lightest I've ever been before a fight. I was walking on like 68 kilos, which is really good for me. And uh, obviously, the weigh-ins did not go to plan at all. Like, and um, it was generally just because of my lack of knowledge with the weight cut at that time. You know what I was going to say, what, what was it? Because it, yeah. it was only, I say only two pounds, but when you're at that. Yeah, level those two pounds are a killer. Oh, expect, they are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's usually the last couple of pounds when you lose yeah. the killers anyway. You know what I mean? But um, nah, it was it was that was a tough pill to swallow. I'd I'd, I'd, I'd fought twice in one night, beating the best guys in Europe, to the next show fighting another best guy in Europe, to it being taken off me before the fight. You know, which is my own fault. You know? I, I understand that. You know, and people are like, oh, it's a bit harsh. They take the belt off you. I send the contract. It was meant to be one thirty-five. Yeah. It wasn't. I didn't come in. The belt got taken off me. So obviously it was one of them situations then that where I was fighting James Brum, that if Brum won, he'd won the world title. But if I had won, then I'm the number one contender for the belt again. And um, yeah, that was tough. Um, I really struggled with like failing the weight, you know what I mean? It was one of them things that back then I didn't have a lot, of, I, I personally didn't have a lot of knowledge on the weight cut and um, I'm a really big worrier. So when I was worrying about my weight all the time, and um, like stress is the number one sign for weight cutting now. You know, I, I realized that the last couple of times that when you're stressed, it kind of holds on to you a little bit right. more. And um, I was I was so stressed out. Like I, I sometimes I'd cry myself asleep. You know, be thinking about it. You know, and uh, yeah. So we, the, 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 obviously we missed weight by two pounds. Uh, it's to the average person. It doesn't sound like a lot. No, no. But, but it's, those last two. Yeah. It's a big. It's a big. Cut. How, how long? How close to the fight did you think I'm not going to make the weight here? Oh, uh, to the wins. I I, I probably. We woke up heavy, very heavy. We woke up about maybe eight pounds over, 
walk up. So we started cutting it down from there. Uh, and like I said, I'm a type of guy who likes to do it over a gradual amount of time, you know what I mean? And um, we must have done, and it's no exaggeration, about nine or ten hot baths, 20 minutes each time, you know? And um, yeah, it was. Uh, I went to the sauna in the LC2, and I was in there for like 20, 30 minutes and jumped on the scales, and it was like 0.1 had come off me of a pound. And I was just like, oh, this is playing plays with your head, first of all. You just know the new it's not going to come off. Uh, that's not going to come head. off. You know, I, I was coming to the point of where like, you know, the last bit of my body fluid was coming out. And uh, it was like 137.3 or something, jumped jump back, went did the sauna, come back, and 137 dead. So it was like, there was no chance of getting that off. Generally, it's, it's obviously it'd be a disappointment, but with it being in Swansea as well, you've got that added pressure. and Yeah. So it must have added everything tenfold. Definitely, yeah. I remember after the fight, and obviously after the fight, I. They kind of came up to me cage wise and said, "Look, it happens." Blah blah. blah. Obviously, he was in hysterics, crying about it all, and, uh, and my my phone was going ting, 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 and people messaging me, "Oh, how I'm professional, all this, how much that." That's the this. first thing people think. Oh, oh yeah. definitely. Even now, to this day, I look and go, "Fucking, I mean, yeah, I mean, wait, this guy up." And then I'm like, "Oh, how I'm professional." Is that? And I realize, well, "Wait, there, you you want me to do it twice, <laughs> yeah. you know?" And I've lost I've lost two world titles because yeah. of it. So um, if they're not in the game, they don't realize. Like, no, they don't re is, is, is no, and that's a big thing. A lot of people have got they're, they're really quick to judge, but never lost. Five pounds in their life, you know what I mean? So um, it was a bit of a tough pill as well. I remember like uh, one of the guys here up here, St Stephen Biffy, he uh, took my phone off me and he went, right, that's going off. You'll have that back tomorrow, he said. <laughs> and we're actually thinking about it. At the time, I was like, well, my phone, well, I at the time, it was really good because of, like I didn't have nothing to look at. And and then the next day, even certain, like, certain UFC fighters were writing stuff down, pathetic, blah, 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 blah. And it was like... Because obviously Brum had trained with Team Alpha Male for that fight as yeah, well, yeah, so yeah. they were on board with it all. And I was like, so obviously waiting on the next day it was it was normal. I, I didn't put, I didn't I didn't put on much weight after the fight either because the weight cut went bad. But people think it doesn't just you don't just make weight and that's it. It's fine. You you make weight and then you go do the rehydration process right. Otherwise it all just all that stuff you've done before. And, it's pointless. Yeah. It's pointless then you know. And um, I didn't put much weight on, but um, the camp itself was amazing. So my fitness was there and everything yeah, yeah. for five rounds. And uh, we went in the fight and we, were, we felt comfortable. I said, I said you were on, I watched it today. I watched it back today. And the commentators were saying that, that Brum's probably coming in 20 pounds heavier than what he weighed in. So you had that on top. You see, he's possibly coming in at, what, 150 odd? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah like, I, I, I consider myself quite big for the weight anyway. But he was, uh, he must have come in... 155 to 160, you know, and I, for the for the guys who, who do kilograms, this guy weighed 61.2 the day before and was set over 70 kilos the next day. So you know these guys after that fight, he, after the fight with me, he didn't he didn't really go back down to that weight. Then he, he stayed at around 145, which is his normal size. You know, some people are good at cutting weight, some people are not. You know, and that and that and that time I wasn't good at cutting weight. You know, some people it's built in them. Like I see some of the, like people I fought and stuff and. They're over like six foot coming down from the middle. Like, how oh, the fuck did he do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm just getting yeah, meals yeah. and shit. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> David Rounds, one of them. He's fought yeah. at every weight class you can. Oh, he drinks a can of coke on the scales. Oh, I, I, I know. Oh. I find that crazy. He does. That. <laughs> like, no, he's going from, from middleweight yeah. to heavyweight. He's... I remember watching his. Was it a tournament in in Holland? He did the heavyweight tournament. Super heavy, wasn't it? Or something? Was it super heavy? Yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember what it was. It was yeah, a big knock one guy out. That's right. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. He got to the final and lost to the final. And he's like, he's fought a middleweight. As a gate man, Dutch tournament. He fought for welterweight title, didn't he, against Jordan James? Seventy-seven. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. He's up, he's up and down, you know what I mean? Crazy, but um, let's talk about this Brum fight then. Obviously, like, we've, we've touched on that. It's, it was in Swansea. The way in didn't go great, but there was a bit of animosity between you beforehand. Yeah? There was. Uh, I, I was in the tournament, um, going back to the tournament, uh, there was obviously four guys. Uh, Pentham beat Chris Edwards to go to the final. I beat Hagstrom to go to the final, but Pentham pulled out. He injured his foot. And he's from Gym 01, the same gym as uh, Brum. So I fought um, Jordan Desborough, a guy from SPG Manchester, who's a really good guy, a really tough, give me a tough fight, beat him. And I think Pendleton must have thought, or Gym 01 must have thought, look, you know, he was going to Pendleton first, then it'd be Brum, but it didn't. They, they give me the, I think they gave me the option, I think, or Chris might have just chosen one, I don't know. But um, we chose Brum. He was 8 0 with Cage Warriors. We thought he was the only guy with that sort of record at that time. And we thought, I mean, it was one of them fights, so we thought, you know what? No, let's give the best guy out there the shot. And, and it was Brum. And um, we gave him the shot. And then there was stuff coming back and forth on Twitter, and like obviously, it, like my, my my brother in the in the two fights in one night was quite, quite drunk. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> he was with the Jim one lot. So like on Twitter, then they started writing stuff about my brother, and it was like for me though, it was like it's, it's part it's part of the game. You're gonna get guys talking about 
bit of smart bit of crap, it's like you know. Different now, isn't it? Because you got like social media, so you can get hold of people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and like, I, I, I'm always on there though. So like, I'll be there, and like I said, I said, I showed you earlier. Like, I, I'll be there. And like, you got an email, and the, and the, and the subject email is "Don't be a pussy." <laughs> oh, yeah. God, you should turn it off sometimes, you know. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> big but fan, right? Some people take it to heart, though, don't they? Like, some people are like, oh, this guy's saying him shit. Like, I love fucking people that yeah. banter me, and I can, like, live off all day. I read, like, the worst stuff in the world and just be like, yeah, fuck you, and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, some people get some, don't it? And yeah, they... definitely, yeah. I, I, and I think at that time, I, I've had a lot of boosts before then, after then, but at that time, I don't know why, it just caught hold of me. I wasn't, like, emotionally involved at all, but it kind of annoyed me. I was going to Twitter, and in the end, I would like go open my phone up and I'd, I I'm in my in my like little thing I got like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I got like Snapchat, whatever. And I'd always ignore that Twitter sign because I was like, well, that's the one that causes me a lot of grief. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'd stop going on there. You know what I mean? I didn't want that to happen, but it did. But um, that's why it, it kind of annoyed me before that fight. Then the strength and conditioning coach was having a pop as well, and I was thinking that guy was a douche anyway. You know what I mean? I remember being like. I remember watching the fight back a couple of days after, after it happened and thinking, why, why do you strength and conditioning coach in the corner of, of, of your fight with you? It's like you squashed through the run, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's unreal, like, you know, and, um, you know, after the fight, obviously, uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit, it was sweet after the fight to see the strength and conditioning coach's face, anyway. For those who, who don't know, we beat, we beat Brum <coughs> dominant five rounds, took him down time after time after time, and although, in all fairness to him, he used the cage well to get up. Yeah. But it was for moments where you just whipped the leg back down and you could see the frustration building up on him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you could see, it. obviously, he was really frustrated in that fight, you know, and um, he was a tough enough guy, you know. They, they were going over his fitness and uh, he was saying he's like one of the fittest guys in the division and uh, blah, blah, blah. And prior to that, I was obviously, I did my eight fights, in, I did the eight rounds, mm. the 40 minutes of fighting in one night and uh, they were like, well, Brett, you know, his fitness is good, Brett's fitness is good. But the way I fight, it's like it don't matter how fit you are, it gets drawn out of you. When you're consistently getting taken on getting back to your feet, it, it just oh, sucks. Yeah, it you know? you, you Psychological as well. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, the big yeah. part you're of like, it. Fuck sake. Yeah, exactly. Again, that, yeah. In the second round, I remember looking and he's and he looked at his corners and say, Phew. you know what I mean? And um, yeah, it, it, the, the the full fight went like that. One of the most boring fights I've ever watched back, and it's me fighting, you know. But, <laughs> but the fifth round, we got about against the cage towards the end. <laughs> And you were letting him tee off and yeah. just looking at him and he's, he's chucking the elbows in. What, what was going on there? Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's, it's one of the things, I do it a lot recently and I shouldn't because I'll probably pay for it in the future, but um, it's, the I, I, it's the last 10 seconds. And whenever you hear the last 10 seconds, the, my first thing my brain tells me is like, do something stupid, do some dumb shit, you know what I mean? And at that time, it was like a single leg against the cage and I remember being like, Kieran, yeah, I remember thinking, last 10 seconds left, so... <laughs> I literally lifted his leg up and looked at him, and the guy's looking at me, and he's like, and he's like, he starts hitting me, and realizes, okay, that's not hurting him. She so starts going elbows, and literally puts his hand, and he elbows me, and I just kind of like, not not so much head, but his elbow, but stick, jump up the point. Then so he does it once, he does it twice. He gets annoyed, and he ends up going, "What the fuck are you doing?" He goes, "What are you doing?" And he slaps me, and I was more insulted, <laughs> and I was more insulted by the slap than the elbows <laughs> and the punches. And then I can remember that I remember thinking, oh, I'll get a quick take down here just to add salt in the wound. And I remember as I, as he put his, he slapped me, I put my head down, managed to like about five seconds, another, another take down. And uh, he was absolutely raging after the fight. You wouldn't shake your hand or anything, would you? No, he wouldn't, no. I, I, I did a, I'm glad I bowed, because if I went up to him, like, he left me hanging like, like a yeah. dick. So I went up to him, and like, as I went, James, I bowed, he kind of went, leave me alone, like, you know, put his hand, leave me alone. I can understand that, you know what I mean? It's the frustration setting in. And after the fight, I went up into the change room, shook hands with him, said thank you. And that was that, you know what I mean? But I, I had a lot of boost after the fight, you know, off, his, off, his, um, off some of his fans and his coaches. And, and they were saying, like, oh, this isn't, this isn't a submission grappling fight. And then you rewind my fight, forget about my fight. You go to James Brown's past eight fights, which is exactly the same. So I don't know what that was all about. But um, I ended up going back up there. I ended up going up to Jim and wanted to train with him for, for a day. And uh, they, they treat me very well. They were very friendly. Brum was there as well. And it was, um, it was good. They, they got some good guys up in Gym 01, you know. And um, my respect, I got a lot of respect for them, you know. It's, just, it's part of the game. You know, you know full well. It's part of the hype in the fight, innit? Do you know what I mean? Some people enjoy it, some people don't. I'm personally not a guy who enjoys it. I'm sure I'm going to learn how to do it. But, um, nah, it, it happened. Obviously, we got the win there. And that was that, was that then. That was the Cage Warriors chapter. Yeah, well, like you say, that was the Cage Warriors chapter. After, after the break, we'll talk about... Um... You going over to America, so we'll be back after this.
Welcome back to part three, guys. So we discussed your Cage Warriors world title. That's top of the tree in Europe. But then after that, you went over to the US and fought on Titan FC, which is one of the major promotions other than like UFC and Bellator out there. And straight in the deep end against Watson. Fucking battle shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, not the norm. On a was it military navy ship or yeah. well, we, no, we, we, we weighed in on the on the uh, the military uh, the USS Alabama, then fought in like some aircraft hangar, which is that I find that nuts really. You know, you're in America and you go because they're massive with the military out there, you know, huge. Yeah. And like when they said the fight, they were like, we fight in the states. And I'm thinking, wow, where are we fighting? We fight in Vegas, we fight in New York, and they're like, Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> uh, what's, a, what's in Alabama? You know what I mean? But um, no, it was we waited in the USS Alabama, which was uh, something I. Well, it was hard to take at the time because I was I was so bad, like I was so like thin and so like dehydrated. I didn't take much of it in. But um, obviously the photos, I, I look back and I think like oh, they look quite cool, you know, yeah, with the ship there. And, and I don't think any other U uh, promotion has done anything like that, you know. And I am, I've seen like I've looked through like MMA photos. I haven't seen anything like that before. Yeah, no, the battleship, yeah. you know what I mean. And uh, it was it was cool. Um, obviously, because they had a, like. Shuttle us back and forth, and I got there, and I was like point, what was it like one point eight over? I was when I got there, and they were like, "Wait, you need to go back to the sauna." So I got there, waiting there, get pointed over, went back to the sauna, and um, I, I go into I go into some detail with this one, it's some graphic detail, but like, I was in the sauna that day for ages. I must have done about an hour and a half of pure sauna time, you know. I must have spent an hour and a half in the sauna, and uh, it was coming off slowly, slowly, slowly. So I, I hit about one thirty-five point something. I knew I got this. It's, as soon as I hit that one thirty-five, I knew I was getting there. And uh, I remember we went back, and I remember sitting there. And we were in the sort of sauna for about two minutes, and then I realised I don't usually need to pee at the, the last moments of the weight cut. And the next minute, my, it's just my bladder was just holding on to something, and I basically pissed in the sauna. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I got, and, I, and like I remember just. Pissing like that, and like there's a random guy there who's just in the sauna for his like health and well-being. Oh, nice. I'm basically pissing my pants here, and like I look, and I'm just about to tell Chris, look, Chris, I peed, and he, I look, <laughs> I look over, and he goes, could have done that a little earlier, couldn't you? <laughs> you know. So we got back to the ship, and I, I was like point two over, and then I dropped my my drawers, and I was I was on weight then, you know what I mean? And I remember being dehydrated, breath, you know what I mean, just there standing there naked in the USS Alabama, probably the happiest I'd been because I made weight, and like that's when I probably. Because after that week, it's usually a week before a fight, I'm miserable. I don't want to see anybody. If I'm in the hotel, I stay in the hotel. Like people are like, oh, I'm in, I'm in Alabama. I can go for a walk, but well, not me. I'll just stay in the hotel. I'm happy just to stay there, watch food channels for about six days, and then four, what you're four, gonna eat four like, days, yeah. and then and then do the weigh-ins. And as soon as I make weight, it's, it goes. It, it just within that second, you you make weight, and bang, it just changes. And um, I looked out the room and saw the the fighters there, and it was like. Um, Desmond Green, there was uh, Kurt Hulabar, there was Pat Healy, there was Stefan Struve wasn't fighting, but he was there. And there was loads of these different fighters. I'm thinking, wow, this, this is amazing. You know, these are guys I've watched on TV. Big, that big name, that yeah. was major, especially someone like Pat Healy who had so many fights. And you see, fuck Heap, you know what I mean? One of the best guys out there in the light with the That's division. the fight I watched the other day. I was trying to yeah. think, I watched Pat Healy, Pat Healy like, like Heap. Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I was looking at them guys, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, the, and it was like a four title fight. So it was like, I think it was like the lightweight, the featherweight, the bantamweight, and the heavyweight. And the, the heavyweight fight was between two UFC vets, Chase Gormley and John Madsen, two heavyweight veterans, like. And, um, yeah, I made weight. I ended, up, I ended up taking the, like, the city in and everything around it, the fight, and happiest I've ever been the, the, after the weigh-ins, you know what I mean? And, um, like you said, the, 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 we ended up getting to this, like, aircraft hangar where they had the event. And I walked in, it was, like, a greenhouse. You know, it's hot now we are in the UK, but it was, it was, like, a greenhouse out there, you know what I mean? And, um... Especially because it's in the south bit of like America, and it was it was it was roasting. Sam, what you were saying then? I was just thinking, when someone says, "Do you want to come and fight in the U.S.?" You're thinking, "Oh, brilliant!" Like you say, Vegas and all. Yeah. Next thing, you're bollock naked on an egg <laughs> on a on a battleship. <laughs> on a I battleship in, yeah, in, yeah, in Alabama. In yeah. yeah. I haven't eaten for two days. Yeah, for two <laughs> days. Pissed off. Yeah. And I just pissed yourself in the sauna. <laughs> I, know, I just I just I just standing there like thinking, God, yeah, I've made it. I'm in Alabama. <laughs> yeah. But um, like you say, that was for it was four title fights. Yours was one of them against Watson, who. You know, is probably like, you'll admit at the time was the best guy you'd fought. De de by far, definitely. Yeah. He was. Um, 
UFC vet for starters. Yeah. Never fought a UFC vet before that. You know what I mean? And uh, not that I'm, I'm, I'm a nervous guy anyway. You know, you say I'll be like, you tell me any fight, I go, I'll fight him, no problem. And then when the contract signs, I go, oh, like a kid in Christmas, he asks for a piano, and then he gets his piano, and he's like. <laughs> Oh, crap, I gotta play the piano, no? you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, with Watson, it was like that. And I was thinking he fought, he'd fought in the UFC, he'd stopped Hector Sandoval, Sandoval, I think his name was. He'd fought Mitch Gagnon, he'd fought, um, fought a couple of good guys, Yves Jabon, he fought TJ Dillashaw. And that was, like, at the time as well, TJ was like champ, and I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is quite, you know what I mean? This is gonna be a tough fight. And um, ironically, it just wasn't, you know what I mean? It was, uh, it was, a, it was a good fight, he was a worthy, definitely a worthy opponent. But in the first round, I kind of take my time and really good jits. He had really good jitsu, like, you know what I mean? And he trains with um, 10th Planet, Eddie Bravo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the best guys in the game, really, you know what I mean? And uh, he come in and uh, he started off start from the feet. So I knew my stand-up's not the best out there. And, like, I looked at his and I didn't think his was. I think we were quite level par. So he was on the feet a little bit and then I managed to get him to the floor. And he, um, he caught Gutierrez, the guy called Anthony Gutierrez, in, like, a double arm bar thing. And I thought, I remember watching bar thinking, that's not going to work with me. And I took him down straight away, and he started doing it, and I was like, I'm stuck. I, and, he's, and he's more or less got it. And I remember Chris screaming, do I take your time, push your shoulders back through? And I remember being in this position thinking, there's me for the last six months saying that's not going to work, and, and he's just about to do it. But I managed to drive my shoulders back in, get on top, and then with about 20 seconds left to go, I caught him in the elbow and thought, wow, that was easy. And I did another one, and I thought, that oh, was easier. And then I remember just thinking, right, just go nuts. And I threw about, it must have been about, 10 elbows in like 15 seconds. I just threw them and threw them and threw them through. And I caught him with a couple of big shots and split him open. And uh, the bell went. I was looking back in the corner and he was stumbling to his corner. So I knew I'd won the first round quite comfortably. It was, you could see he was tough though. You know, he hit him with some big shots there and he didn't, didn't budge, you know what I mean? But you could see he went to his corner and he was a little bit, um, little bit kind of dizzy and stuff. And you could see him stumbling back and forth. And then I remember looking at his corner and I looked at one person and his mouth's not moving. And then I looked at the next person in his corner, and his mouth's not moving. And um, there's a woman called Liz Carmouche, who yeah. was the first ever woman to fight Ronda Rouse for UFC yeah, title. Yeah. She was in the corner, and she wouldn't say nothing. So it was a silent. Like, uh, and I, even, the, even the commentators were saying, like, it's silent over there. And I remember hearing that from the, like, from in my corner, hearing Faraz Zahabi, GSP's coach, going, that's silent in that corner. And I knew that that was it then. I knew I, I walked in the second round, did the same thing again managed to beat him up and then eventually he was just sick of taking the shot. So he gave his back up, managed to like take his back. But like as I took his back, he stood up. So I was like a rucksack on him, just hanging on his back. <laughs> and I managed to stick the choke in and uh, he tapped out. So I think I think on the on the forums they were saying like Brett to win by decision was a quite a high and Wild to win by submission was quite high. So it was nice to get that sub. I'm known for like I'm not known for knocking people clean out. I'm just known for taking people's decisions, wrestling, and it was nice. Yeah, it was nice to get that second round in, but it was one of them weird, fight, one of them weird fights. Because when I'm in a fight, I enjoy a good tear up. I enjoy a good fight. But I remember winning that second. I remember winning that fight in the second round. I went back to the the aircraft hangar canteen, and um, I sat there, and we put I mean, it was me and Chris, and uh, I sat there, put my belt in front of me, and it just wasn't that same feeling. I felt like I didn't have a fight, and that's what I signed up for to have a fight, you know. So you'd rather a five-round tear-up than... This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. he's exactly the same. Yeah. He wants this, this yeah. war yeah, I don't, I don't, he retires. I don't mean, I don't mean like, um, it doesn't have to be a stand-up war either. I just want to, you know what I mean? It could, be, it could be a bit of everything. It could be, you know, I, I, I fight, a, a perfect example of a fight I'd love to be in was um, the Korean Zombie versus uh, Leonid Garcia and WEC. It was like a bar fight. They were throwing stuff from their hips. They were, and I remember, I remember looking at a photo after uh, after the fight, and they were both arm in arm like that after the fight. They, like uh, the Korean Zombie lost that night, and they both got broken arms, and they both busted up. And I'm thinking that's what I wanted to be involved in. That's exactly how no, I that's feel. Just as is. I want to be on that where it's just the edge where you're like, fucking hell, this is this is like life on the line type shit. Yeah, that's what yeah. I want to think about. Like, and like, I, I always think like uh, the, the Ivan Drago and the Rocky. Film, <laughs> you know, I think I want one of them ones, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like I said, it, for me, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like, um, I don't consider myself a high level striker. I'm not, you know, I'm more of a wrestler. But like, I, I end up putting myself in situations where I like them situations. People are thinking, what are you doing? Like watching it back. 
But I'm like, that makes me feel good, you know? That's a bit of excitement. That's, that's like, got probably why you got, like, fans as well. I know some, like, MME fighters, they play it safe and just go to their strengths. Yeah. Whereas if you do something different and people... It's more entertaining, then, isn't it? I did a lot of that, though. I did a lot yeah. of that growing up. Do you know what you're saying about like, just getting the decisions, just getting the wins? I did a lot of that. And like, to the last couple of fights, that's when I've kind of just gone, you know what? No, let's just enjoy the fight for what it is. And... Um, the Watson fight was nice to get that sub because everyone's like, I remember getting, I was getting the good tweets then. Like people going like, oh, amazing sub, unbelievable sub. And I remember some guy putting something on YouTube like, oh, this is the best sub I've seen. And all that's an over exaggeration of just, like some people, like it's not the best sub I've ever seen. But it was nice for that guy to say that, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And it was nice, I'd done something good. It, it's nice to have them, like I said, them five run wars. And then it's nice to get them early stoppages. You know, I don't get paid for overtime. <laughs> you know? But again, we'll go back. You come from the high of beating Watson for the title, and you fight Gutierrez. Yeah, next. Same, same story there. Yeah, and the weight weight's an issue again. Again, but I think I've read or I've watched a video where you were ill on that. Is that right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, I, I caught I caught um, a, a bug prior to that one, but like I said, you know, no, nobody cares. <laughs> I know that's that's the yeah. way it is. You know, people say you still feel weird. Don't matter how ill you are, like I said, it's the people who don't do it. They'll see it come up and they Brett Johns and they'll be like, oh, he's fucking missed weight again. He's done it yeah. again, you know what I mean? And that was, and that was another one. And uh, I remember watching, um, I think it was Carthal Pendred, who was an Irish MMA fighter. He said, oh, look, he's that, you know, how unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. blah. That hit home, because like I said, you know, I was like, oh, well, the even fighters are jumping on the bandwagon. I was saying about it. Uh, yeah, I was. I was ill, I was Ill before the fight, and uh, I got within like a pound of the, the weight. Um, and like I said, the, the, the fight, like I said, I'd won a world title. Did, and I had a, the, the cage was an amazing performance, won a world title. The Watson fight, I consider a good performance. There was a lot of things I could have worked on, but it was a good performance, won a world title, to then straight after it, ruining it, you know what I mean? Uh, that, so that, that kind of killed me as well. And I remember getting there, got taken to the hospital. They were like, you need, to, you need to use an IV. And that was when the IVs were banned. And he was like, oh. I was like, I can't. And they're like, well, you know, you, you, you're going to die if you don't do it, like, you know what I mean? And I was like, I can't. I am traveled 4,000 miles to not fight. You know, and like where I was fighting was Kansas City, and it was oh, it was a different, incredible heat. I was going in the sauna and losing weight, then coming outside, and it was the exact same heat. You know, it was it was crazy, and um, I felt ill. I was I ended up like basically I had Chris uh, in my bedroom, just kind of like trying to calm me down a little bit. I was like shaking in bed, uncontrollably shaking in bed. It was to the point where like that's when the 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 Titan FC officials come in and said like you got to go to the, like the the doctors, you got to see someone. So I refused, I refused to have an IV, jump on the scales, probably should have. I was again like really bad stomach cramps as well. And uh, jump on the scales, it was like 136 something, failed weight again. And that was twice on the trot then. And that was like, that was when I, I probably would have, that was when I was just about to decide whether I was going to stay at bantam weight or go up to featherweight. But like I said, I was looking at featherweights at that time and they were big guys at featherweights then. I was thinking, well, you know, I go up a weight, I'm too small. I'm you, I'm too big, or I think I'm too big. And then, uh, you know, the, the fight didn't even go to plan. Worst, worst fight of my career, hands down, you know? Before we go into the fight, we'll just take a quick break and we're going to come back to Gutierrez and then hitting the big time with, with the UFC. back guys so we were just touching on uh, your defense of the tight gun you said you missed weight but the fight went ahead it was against Gutierrez yeah. first <laughs> right. time yeah first, first time, time. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did that go tell us what you said it was the worst performance <sighs> probably most important thing was the win though yeah definitely I, I, I'm I'm known for being quite fit in fights like you know and um, going five rounds and I've, like I said in cage was I went twice in one night you know and um, I fought the first round smashed the first round in my opinion and won the second round and I'm thinking I'm getting tired, I'm getting tired, you know what I mean? I don't feel as tired usually until the fifth round. I was getting tired. The third round went out the window completely and utterly. I ended up um, taking a step on the canvas and the canvas material they were using was like, um, like slippery. When it got wet, it was really slippery. Uh, my foot slipped and I ended up like suspectly tearing tear my hamstring. That's what I thought it was originally. So I was like on the floor like, and I'm like holding my leg and like he's hammer fisting me and I'm trying to like try to block and then hold my leg. Uh, but I managed to get out of that round. So I think I, I, in my head, I, run, I won round one, two. Uh, and then obviously the, th the third round, I said I'd give it to him only because obviously I, I basically 
pulled guard and let the guy pick me up so I could get feeling back my knee. And then fourth, I beat him up, and fifth, then I was a win as well. And like I said, I do that stupid thing the last 10 seconds where, like, I remember just thinking, right, it's the last 10 seconds, what can I do? All right, let's just let him fly knee me five or six times. <laughs> and that's what I did. He, he called a time, he just started jumping knee in, and I was just, and he pushed me into the cage, he started going body shots. And I remember thinking at the time, because that was when I had my stomach cramps the day before. I remember thinking, I can't take many of these. And I, I thought, right, instead... I'm going to shit myself. Yeah, I know. So I, I, generally thought, I generally thought that. And I, I thought, right, okay, instead of blocking, I'll just do this. I just put my hand up as if I'd won the fight. <coughs> Ten seconds into the fight, just taking body shots. You know what I mean? I should have blocked the shots or something. I wasn't. I just put my hand up and celebrated. Ten seconds before. And it was in Kansas City, where he's from, and it was hostile. You know, the fans had been there since, like, four o'clock. It was... They turned the air conditioning off. They'd been drinking since, like, four o'clock. It was hostile. And I remember being after the fight, and I was like, they were like, and they were uh, by split decision, it was just, which was nuts, because I thought I'd definitely run four rounds to one, if at worst, three rounds to two. And they would split decision, like, what? I thought, this, is, this isn't going my way. It's the first time I've gone to the decision in America. I thought they've tucked me up here. But like, enough, they didn't. They said I was the winner. And uh, I remember the crowd booing, so I like, giving them a bit of that, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, getting a shot. I was, <laughs> out there. yeah, no, it's crazy out there. And um, yeah, so I won that fight, and then, um, was scheduled to fight then. That was the July. I had some time off. A load of injuries, plagued with injuries after that. Uh, then we scheduled. We thought, right, you know, the injuries are over and done with. Let's we fight Ricky Simone's in um, March, which was in Oregon. So it was like it was like uh, so Alabama's like here, and then Kansas is here, and then Oregon's over here. So they were getting about time. Work. And I had to pull out the fight. Um, my shoulder had. Um, I, I had some bad trouble with my shoulder since five and zero as a professional. But then uh, in that camp, I ended up, um, I was doing a bit of, I, I ended up falling awkwardly on it, then thinking, nah, it's okay, it, it was hurting, but I was like, that's okay. And then did another session, it got pulled out again. And it was a point that when I was throwing shots and sparring, it was coming out and going back in all the time. You know, it wasn't even like, it wouldn't stay out, it just pop up and go back in. And in a fight, you can't let that happen, like, you know, because I mean? I'd do it and I'd be like, right, if it didn't bother me, I could put my hands on and carry on, it'd be fine. But I was doing it, it'd go. And I'd have to keep my arm by my side for 30 seconds and then get it back up and then do that and again. So obviously surgery was the only thing to do. And, um, you know, after that, you know, I had to pull out the, the Ricky Simone's fight. And uh, 8,000 pound later, my shoulder was fixed. Uh, it's been, it's been all right, it's been great. I still get trouble with it now, but it's, it's all right. And um, we had a pull from that fight then, you know what I mean? And uh, I had uh, about three or four months where I went on the loose, you know, there was no fight and there was hardly any training because I couldn't do much with that. Not even running, you know, I couldn't even run. And uh, at that time, I was blessed. I was lucky that the Euros was on with the football. <laughs> so I was out in France, absolutely steaming drunk. And um, there's a photo, so there's like a, like a, I say famous, not famous, well, there's a photo with the, in the group of boys and with on WhatsApp. Like occasionally they say, I oh, remember that time when Brett went off the rails. They say when I retired, as a joke. <laughs> and it's me, and I'm wearing like a Stone Island jump. I got a fag on my hand, a beer, and a pair of glasses on. I'm in Lille. Like in the, uh, it was like the time of my life. You know, as a, as a fighting year, 20, 2016 was the worst year of my life. It was hands down, it was terrible. And, uh, but as an enjoyable year, I'm lucky that my brother paid for the full thing. I was skint, like I said, these fires. I had to sell my car for like 100 quid before. I had no money, I had no money to live. But my brother paid for that trip out there and really helped me out and stuff. And uh, if it wasn't for that, then 2016 would have been a waste of time until November. The uh, famous phone call. Yeah. Just about to get to it. The, was he your manager who filmed, filmed it? Or? Yeah, I, I don't know why he, he, he filmed it. I'm not sure if Chris had said, look, this guy's going to be like a baby when you say, I'm going to get the camera out. <laughs> it's going to uh, go viral. No, yeah. So um, he, he videoed it. And uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm an emotional guy anyway. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, obviously, he'd phoned me up the night before. I was up all night. My, bro my, my little brother had just turned 18 at the time. And it was his first night in town, you know, Swansea. And I'm just, I was, I was quite curious about what he was doing. So I was, I was in and out of sleep. And a phone number come up. I thought, right, this is him now. And I'm thinking he's been arrested. I look at the phone, and it's like 444-555. And it's like, that's not a UK number. I'm like, hello. You know, like PPI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went for the phone down, for the phone on the UFC, <laughs> like, you know. And, um... Hello. He goes, uh, he's like, hey man, it's your, it's your, it's your manager, Brian. I'm like, Brian, so what are you doing for me at 4 o'clock in the morning? He's like, uh, I need you to get ready. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you might be on the UFC Belfast guy. And I'm like, what? And I, I, like, at that time, it was like amazing, exciting, but I'd potentially been in the UFC for about four or five fights before that. So it was like, it was hard to get pumped for it, but it was the first time I was having a phone call from him. 
And originally, believe it or not, originally it was meant to be Ross Pearson that I was meant to fight. Yeah? Yeah. I was talking, wow. we were going to fight at, um, you know, that, I'm not sure how that would have went down, but, um, <laughs> but basically they said that uh, Pearson was a short notice fight and Stevie Ray stepped in. But they said, um, they said what Brett, what, what's Brett weighing? And Chris has completely lied. As I happened to be in really good shape at that time because I was preparing for like a K1 fight. And uh, Chris goes to get to me, he goes, uh, yeah, he's about 160, 165, yeah, yeah. I was like 150, I was walking around 70 key. It was the fight that, that they wanted, I was hit 70 K. And um, apparently Stevie took in, I was like, oh, well, that, that's an opportunity you missed. But I was willing to do that just to get in, you know what I mean? But I didn't fancy fighting Ross Pearson, you know, the guy would have walked <laughs> 80 kilos, like it would have been nuts, sort of. <laughs> and um, I thought, right, that's, that's that opportunity gone. And I kind of had a phone call and they said, right, you'll find this guy, Quan Ho Quack from South Korea. And um, I, I heard of him before that anyway. He was, like, he was like the number one prospect in Asia. Yeah, he was like 9-0. Yeah, 9-0, yeah. two-time world champion. You know, he fought um, Aztecic, Aztecic Osgalic. Oh, see, I'd be <laughs> fucked right You should have given that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Write it down for me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was a, he was a UFC flyweight who went up the bantamweight then to fight in some uh, promotion up in, uh, in um, Korea. And uh, they were like, you're fighting him. And he was running fights at three weeks' notice. I was, I was in good shape. I was lucky enough I was in good shape anyway. And they were like, you want to you fight? So I was like, and that was when the weight cut thing was a big thing for me. And I was like, I've only got three weeks to lose weight. And I was like playing on my head. And that's when I, my, my brother spoke to, um, my brother spoke to uh, my strength and conditioning coach, Garth Beer. And he went, uh, Garth, you need to chat with him. He, you know, mentally, he's, he's breaking him. So he had a chat with me. It was only there was a little coffee with my 50 minute chat. And he said, look, you need to change your attitude. See, you just need to change your attitude. Stop being stressed about it. You're going to have to do it. Do it. And I remember thinking, I don't know what it was, it was like a switch in my head, and I went, you know what, yeah, it's right, I'm going to do it. It's my UFC day, but I'm going to make weight. I'm going to have to make weight. It wasn't at 135 for starters, because it wasn't a type of fight. It was just a normal bout in the UFC, so I had the pound allowance. And I thought, no, I'll do it. And it just turned out to be one of the easiest weight cuts I've ever done. And it was, and it generally was. You know, I got to, um, usually I used to wake up with five pounds to go. Now I wake up with two or well, one or two pounds to go, two pounds the most. And uh, I get to my, I got my little plan now that I follow my plan to the fight and it's, it's brilliant, you know. And so um, obviously Bel Belfast that whole week, I was in my hotel room, as I do all the time. I was doing occasional sessions and I was in the best shape of my life. Made weight, 136 on the dot. And that was when it was like, right, now I can take the experience in. Because up to that point, you can't. I'm passing UFC fighters all the time. You know, a guy I really like well, I got a good relationship with Brad Pickett. I saw him in, Be in Belfast. Uh, I, I saw UFC for Ian McCall was meant to be on the card. There was loads of fighters there. It was pa uh, Paul Felder who was on the card. There was loads of good fighters there. But obviously, even when I was there, I couldn't take it all in because of, like, I was going through the weight cutting and all that rubbish. So um, after you make weight, it just everybody seems to be... Every single fight is weird. You've probably seen it yourself, James. You know when like, you make weight and it's like... You, you can see, like, in the way-ins, people come and they're really depressed and they make weight, and everybody's just going, hey, we want me weight, brilliant, hey, and everybody's <laughs> happy. Done, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, obviously went to Nando's, and it's obviously full of cauliflower years and UFC T-shirts. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, and it was after that, it was amazing. I did the way, I, then after that, you got the public weigh-ins, which the public they, weigh-ins... They looked awesome. They I have not fought in front of a crowd like that before. It was just, and there was all these people here just ready to watch two men get half naked and weigh in and square off, like, I mean, <laughs> I hadn't fought in front of that many people before. And uh, I thought I'd give him the mean mugs. I'd give him the good little mean mug as I do. I got my, my only rule, which is don't touch. You can go as close as you want, but don't touch. I mean, as soon as, it, as, soon as someone touches me forward to forward, they go and fly in there, you know? And um, I remember getting really close, and it was a good, good, good stare off. And I remember looking at the crowd, and oh, my, my, my brother arranges everything with the trips, and they're all the boys, uh, red t shirts, Welsh bucket hats on. That's all I need, <laughs> you know? And uh, no, the wings were amazing. And then I went, to, I went to bed that night, amazing sleep. And then I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. I can't get, I wake up very early before a fight. I just sitting there, just looking around the room, looking at my corner and sleeping, just like waiting for an hour or two. And then uh, the full day was really nerve wracking because it was like, it's like eight years of work on November the 19th. That's the only day that mattered. So it's eight years of work for that one day on November 19th. And uh, we got to the venue, did the rules meeting, stepped in the cage, was like, whoa, this is crazy. You see all the logos on it, like Monster Energy and the UFC Fight Pass. And, and there was, um, there was, a, there was a, on, the, on the pad on the side of the cage, it was, uh, they were promoting Chromie versus Johnson 2, the one that, that, that Chromie pulled out of. Oh, yeah. So it was, like, it, was really, um, it, it was really crazy. It's a real feeling. And uh, I, rem I, remember, like, I remember walking back to the change room 
And I had my stuff on looking down. And I saw my UFC kit on. I thought, this is it. You, there's no higher than this. You can't go higher than this. And uh, yeah, everything went crazy. I, wa I walked as I'm walking out of the fight. I usually scream some stuff for the fight, like my time. And um, this one was let's go for some strange reason. I was going, let's go, screaming, let's go. And uh, they were like, there's curtains. So I haven't seen the crowd yet, so I don't know what the crowd is like. And um, the, crowd, the crowd was empty compared to the main event, but it was loud anyway. And the curtain was there, and the guy's like, well, wait, you're, and I'm screaming, I'm cr basically on the verge of crying. And they open the, they open the shutters. Brett John's come through, so he opens through, my head's down. I look up, who's like about five metres away from me? McGregor, standing there. Looking at me, just nodding his head, saying, you know, let's go on, go and do your oh, thing. Yeah. Time to go, yeah, time to go. And uh, I remember looking at him, and he looked at me, and you could just see that little chin up, little, little <laughs> nod, you know what I mean? I don't know why, that was like, when I, I thought, right, this is it. I got no, I just no turning back now. And I remember walking out, and obviously the fight went ahead, and I didn't, I blacked out then. Like I said to you guys earlier, I blacked out after the fight. Uh, I managed to obviously win the fight, it, and it was, um, it was, I guess I was one of them fights. It was, it was just a hell of a scrap. It was, it was like, exciting because most people would think you're going to take him down or yeah. whatever. But like you said, you mixed, you mixed it up. You were flying knees. It yeah. was fucking. I know. Heavy. I was saying, I was saying like, uh, earlier. So some fighters then they, they do their strength too much and they, and they hold on to strength. And, I, and for a UFC debut, I think I would have gotten away with that. Just win your first fight, then mm. you're fine. And I just remember thinking, this fight's just not going to plan. Like you know, I just thought I'd taken the guy down like six, eleven times in the first round. And I thought I won the first round, and I, and I was just enjoying. I was in, I was there on my feet, and I was throwing shots. And it's one of the things for a grappler to strike in. You know, you Some put, of the best photos from a fight are you throwing punches, throwing punches. And coming up a yeah. Cup you, yeah, yeah. I wish that I wish I could do it at the gym. I can't though. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I remember thinking like it's obviously different for you. You can you can strike. I, 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 in my head, I can't strike as well as like the top level boxers. I can grapple, and I remember just I remember thinking he threw. He was throwing jabs and slipping, throwing right hands. He was just catching. I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. Oh, now I know why yeah. these boxes feel like. <laughs> I think, why am I getting punched in the face all the time? I don't know. It was just, it was just, the fight went great. And I remember thinking at the time, Scott Pedersen, an amateur, who just won the amateur cage wars like with title. Yeah, he's a good guy, yeah, good guy, yeah, youngster, good. amateur guy. Yeah, we, I trained with some sharks and, and Chris's, you know, really good guys. They're not like, they're, 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 low, they're, they're really good, but they're quietly good, and they're not, nobody's like you well yet. And uh, I remember playing about with a few flying knees, and like at the time, it was like, Scott was, I remember Scott looking at me and going, that, that, that worked, that will. I'm like, yeah, I'll, maybe, yes, I'll, I'll try it out. But everybody in the gym takes the mickey because I'm like a bit of a boring fight now, you know what I mean? And I remember thinking, in the fight, it was like certain round, my, my head just, in that fight, it just went, well, you've got nothing to lose. You've won this fight so far, give it a go. And he just, he fell for it. I just changed levels, looked down to the floor, he went to defend the takedown, I just jumped up and threw it. And it landed peach, more or less. Even, even after the fight, there was no injuries at all other than a massive bruise on my knee. <laughs> imprint of his face. That was his chin. Just chin, chin yeah. print. And, then, and he, he came out in the third round, you know, obviously his corner man must have told him, look, you know, you lost the first two, you need to win the third. And uh, that's generally what happened. He came out and uh, managed to get the early takedown in the, in the third. I, I beat him up a, a lot in the third round. And um, 10 seconds left to go, he was like, he was just teeing off, and it was like, I was just kind of trying to hold on. And then I remember, like, the ref, it was like, over. And I remember just falling on top of him, like, thinking, saying thank you. And then the, the vote come in then, it was like, it was like a 30 27, you know. I'd, I'd broke a UFC record my first fight, and it was arguably the fight of the night. And it was just, I, and then after that, you know, it was just had the time of my life, really. Right, before we wrap it up, brilliant so far for people to get to know the ins and outs of what it's like in the UFC. But um, we'll quickly touch your fighting in July, July 16th against Mitch Gagnon, who is top, top draw fighter. He's been again in with Burrow. He's been in with the top boy, so that's, that's a good step up it's for the, you. It's, the, it's definitely the hardest fight in my life. The guy, uh, like I said, when he fought Renan Burrow, Renan Burrow was a former UFC yeah. Batman champion. He was four, Mitch was 14th in the world. That's, that's a, it's a big scalp, and it was a big test. And when they, give, when they give the name to me, it was like, okay, this is one of them fights. I've asked to have white shorts, and the reason why I've asked to have white shorts is because I know this one, there'll be, there'll be a lot of blood in this fight, you know? I'm, Sick bastard. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it, you know what I mean? But um, nah, it's, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, get, to going in there. But um, it's going to be good, it's going to be good. Um, right, that's July the 16th in Glasgow. 
Have you got any shout outs to anybody you want to? Yeah, I've got a few, uh, few obviously, with my, my, my training gyms like Christmas Academy, Dragon School of Combat, um, the Edge Men's Wear in um, Port Alba for my clothing. Um, the support A1 guys, obviously, they, you know, they, 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 they're behind me a lot. A couple of them are in Belfast watching the fight as well, so support A1 guys. Um, and Booster Fight, you know, were behind me as well. And it's, it's um, oh, and Tanabi as well. Tanabi is another big one as well. And uh, they've, been, they've been great over the years. They've really helped me out. So, um, it's a big thank you to them guys. And thanks for having me on. Awesome. No, thank you thank for coming you. on. Where you going, mate? July. Start the tradition. You get your sign this. Oh. Lou Long, you're right. I will be at the gym to get you to sign this. <laughs> Sign it wherever you want, mate. Sign it wherever you want, mate. I'll go with you now. Thank you, boys. Nice. No, all the best. Thank you. Appreciate that, mate. Nice to meet you as well. Too. All the best in July, mate. Thank you. All the best. And that is episode, what are we, three of Turn the Lights Out. Thanks for watching.